All right, so this video is going to focus on species, origin of them. So Darwin identified plants and animals that did not exist elsewhere um, when he visited the Galapagos Islands. Um, the speciation, which is described as the origin of new species, is basically connecting microevolution, which are the allele changes, to macroevolution, which are broader patterns that we see. Um, so evolutionary theory um, is basically the, um, going to help us connect those two together and better understand how species can originate and how populations can evolve. Um, so microevolution, again, is focusing on those allele frequency changes in a population over a period of time, while macroevolution is looking at larger patterns of evolutionary change, um, not at the species level. So we're looking um, higher up, genus, phylums, families, classes, along those lines. So biological species concept, there are lots of ways that species can be defined, but the biological species concept focuses on reproductive isolation. Um, that's not the only way that organisms are organized or grouped. Um, they can be grouped based on morphology, physiology, biochemistry, as well as their nucleic acid sequences. Um, so according to biological species, um, a species is a group of populations. The members have the ability to interbreed, and not only can they interbreed, but they can produce offspring that are living and are capable of interbreeding, are capable of producing offspring. They are not able to successfully breed with other populations. Um, gene flow within populations is what holds those phenotypes together. So reproductive isolation um, is basically biological barriers that prevent two species from being able to successfully produce viable fertile offspring. Hybrids are going to be the offspring that are produced from biological species um, mating with one another, so different species mating. Um, you can have reproductive isolation both before and after fertilization. Beforehand is prezygotic, afterwards is postzygotic. So these are some of the examples we're going to talk about. For prezygotic, there are five habitat, temporal, behavioral, mechanical, and gametic. While postzygotic, we have three reduced hybrid viability, reduced hybrid fertility, and then hybrid breakdown. So prezygotic barriers basically prevent fertilization from taking place. Um, the ways that they are able to do that are impeding the species from mating with one another, um, preventing mating from being successfully completed, and then hindering the fertilization process if the mating is successful. So habitat isolation, the species would be rare, rarely encounter one another. Um, they occupy different habitats. Um, they don't have to necessarily be separated by physical barriers. Temporal isolation would be the time, um, not just of day, but also throughout the seasons and years um, at which species are able to breed. Um, and if they encounter one another and it's not during the breeding time and they don't match up, they would not mix gametes. Behavioral isolation would come about with courtship rituals or other behaviors um, that are kind of unique and are only going to be um, recognized by a given species. Mechanical isolation, um, there are physical differences between the species that prevent mating from being successful. And then gametic isolation um, would be when there are differences between sperms and eggs that don't allow them to successfully fertilize, um, that there are just barriers um, that prevent sperm from fertilizing eggs. Postzygotic, again, the fertilization was successful but the zygote that forms the hybrid is not able to successfully develop into a viable fertile adult. Um, so reduced hybrid viability um, is that the genes of the parent species um, do not interact successfully and prevent that hybrid from developing um, properly. So it's probably gonna be a little weaker. Um, reduced hybrid fertility. Um, even if the hybrids are strong, um, such as um, with a mule, um, they are unable to reproduce. 
And then hybrid breakdown, you can have some generations of hybrids, the initial hybrids that are fertile, but when they mate and produce offspring, their offspring are sterile or are pretty weak. They're we um, feeble and are uncapable or unlikely to be able to reproduce. So why do we have so many different concepts of species? Um, because one definition doesn't necessarily fit everything. Um, with biological species, we cannot apply that concept to fossils or to organisms that reproduce asexually. Um, the biological species concept um, focuses on gene flow being absent, um, but gene flow can occur between species that are similar, um, such as with bears, specifically grizzly bears and polar bears are able to mate and produce growler bears. Some other definitions, we talked about some of the other ways that we can organize or describe organisms. Um, and so what we've been talking about with biological species is focusing on the differences. We can also focus on the unity. Um, morphological species is looking at structural features. Um, so this can apply to both sexual and asexual species, um, but the criteria is subjective. Um, ecological species is looking at it in terms of its ecological niche. Um, so it would apply to species that are both sexual and asexual. Um, it's going to be more focused on the role of disruptive selection and natural selection. And then the phylogenetic species concept is looking at species being the smallest group of individuals found on a phylogenetic tree. We're going to spend some more time on that um, coming up. Um, so this would apply to, again, both species that produce sec reproduce sexually and asexually, um, but it doesn't necessarily make it as easy to determine how different the species have to be to be classified as separate species. So ways speciation can take place um, can involve geography, absolutely, but it does not have to involve geography. Allopatric speciation is going to be the formation of a new species from a population um, that gets geographically separated from its parent population. Um, that one's a little bit more straightforward. Sympatric speciation is more subtle. It's when you have a subset of a population that is capable of forming a new species, but they still stay with the parent species. So there's no geographic separation present. We're going to focus first on allopatric. Um, gene flow becomes interrupted or reduced um, when this population gets divided into separate geographically isolated subpopulations. Um, and this is how um, it is thought the flightless cormorant found on the Galapagos um, was first um, classified as a species, how it came to be. Um, barriers are going to vary depending on how a population is able to move. Um, such as like a canyon might prevent rodents um, from uh, populations of rodents from coming back together, but it would not limit birds, coyotes, or pollen. Um, there are populations that can evolve independently as a result of mutation, genetic drift, natural selection. Um, and reproductive isolation could occur as a result of those allelic frequency changes. Um, it's thought that the mosquito fish in the Bahamas um, are able to have several isolated populations. Um, they're located in different ponds. Um, we also saw how a geographic separation could keep snapping shrimp, um, alpheus, um, or um, separate them. Um, and because of their environmental changes, um, they have separated, but their closest species is the one on the other side of the isthmus. Um, so these species originated 9 to 13 million years ago, and it separated the Atlantic from the Pacific waters. Um, so geographic barriers are likely to result in more speciation than those that have fewer barriers. Um, reproductive isolation typically is going to increase as the distance increases. Um, the reproductive barriers are not due to the physical separation um, the separation is not a biological barrier, but there are enough changes that take place due to the environmental changes 
and the allelic frequencies um, that change within those populations that speciation can occur. Sympatric, as I said, is going to take place in overlapping populations geographically speaking. So some factors that could lead to sympatric speciation include polyploidy, having multiple copies of chromosomal sets, having some slight differences in habitat, habitat differentiation, as well as sexual selection. So polyploidy is when you get some extra sets of chromosomes as a result of mistakes that take place during cell division. This is seen a lot more in plants than animals. Lots of important crops are polyploids. Autopolyploid plants are going to, or autopolyploid individuals are those with more than two chromosome sets that came from one species. While allopolyploidy, I can't say these words, I'm sorry, Allopolyploid is a species that has multiple chromosomal sets, but they get them from different species. So here we are seeing two species with different numbers of diploid chromosomes. There was a meiotic error, and when the gametes um, were formed, one formed properly, the other one went through non-disjunction. A hybrid formed between um, the two species, um, and that led to a gamete having um, a different amount of chromosomes um, from that hybrid. Some were able to separate, others were not. And then we have another gamete from one of those species come back together, and it is going to provide the full set of chromosomes that are needed so that they all have two copies of each of the chromosomes from the original two species. Um, habitat differentiation. Um, again, it can occur as a result of new ecological niches forming. Um, so let's say a tree gets introduced here. We have these apple trees that get introduced, and they are going to provide um, a more suitable environment for these maggot flies um, to live on. Um, they can also live on the hawthorn trees, but by having a new food source that might lead to speciation taking place. Sexual selection, as we talked about in um, chapter 23, um, I think it was 23, it could be 22, um, can also be a source of um, sympatric speciation um, by having a preference for mates um, that could lead to speciation forming because those alleles are going to be more likely to be passed on to future offspring. Um, we see this in the cichlid fish. So overall, allopatric speciation is definitely going to have geographic isolation um, over time. That's going to prevent um, gene flow from moving between populations. Um, reproductive isolation can then occur as a result of natural selection or genetic drift or sexual selection in these isolated populations. If the species come back together, if the populations come back together, interbreeding is not successful. With sympatric speciation, um, you have some sort of reproductive barrier within a subset of the population. Um, it's not going to have a physical separation. As we said, polyploidy, natural selection, or sexual selection can lead to sympatric speciation. Hybrid zones um, help to identify factors that can lead to this reproductive isolation. Hybrid zones are when we have members of different species that are able to mate and produce hybrids. Um, those hybrids um, are going to be successfully formed um, because the reproductive barriers are not complete. Um, so they can occur in a single band um, where the species meet together. We see that with toads. Um, there's a pretty long and narrow hybrid zone. Um, these hybrids typically do have reduced fitness um, compared to their parent species. Um, and the hybrid zones can be a little more complex if the parent species are found um, throughout a region just in certain patches. So here you can see the hybrid zone between the toads. You have your yellow and you have your fire bellied and you can see the changes in the allele frequencies between the yellow and the fire bellied, um, and then what happens in the hybrid zone. So when we have these hybrid zones, when we have a gene flow restriction and we have a population diverge from those parent populations, um, 
you can have one of three possible outcomes when these species interact in this hybrid zone. You could have the two um, remain stable and kind of at that same level of hybrid zone um, separation between them. You could have enough similarities between the species that over time those hybrids are going to result in the hybrid zone being fused back together. And then you could have the hybrid zone become more and more limited over time, and that's when you would have reinforcement and you would have the distinction between the two species. So reinforcement is going to occur when the hybrids are not fit as, um, as well, much as the parent species are. And so again, over time, you're not going to have that hybridization rate increase. It's going to diminish um, the reproductive barriers. Um, are going to be stronger um, for the sympatrics um, since they have to share the same environment as opposed to the allopatrics. Um, so reinforcement is going to be um, able to distinguish more clearly between the sympatrics versus the allopatrics. Um, here you have a female male, mate choice because the sympatrics have that physical difference. The females are more successfully going to be able to choose a mate of their own species. Well, allopatric, because of the physical separation, there doesn't have to be as much of a physical change in those species, and so it is much more likely that a female choosing a mate might pick one um, from a related species, but not her own. Fusion, again, is going to reduce those reproductive barriers. Um, if the hybrids have a similar fitness as the parents, you're going to have a lot of gene flow that's going to prevent that restriction occurring. And so then you can have the species fuse back together. Um, and this has happened. Um, I think that various environmental factors may lead to fusion taking place. We do see this with the cichlids um, because the difference between the males are a color choice and pollution makes it more challenging for the females to distinguish between that color choice, um, which makes it more likely for them to mate with a related species, but not one of their own. And then stability, you're gonna to continue to have hybrids, um, but what you're having happen is a lot of gene flow outside of the hybrid zone. So even though um, there might be selection for increased reproductive isolation within it, the amount of gene flow taking place with um, outside of it allows them to kind of keep the path that they're on. So um, how speciation occurs, the thoughts behind it, the theories behind it, um, there's a couple that vary. Um, one thought is does it occur rapidly or does it occur slowly? And another is does it occur with just a couple of genes or does it occur with several? Um, so there's still a lot of questions left to answer in regards to um, evolutionary biology, how long it takes for species to form, how many genes need to differ. Um, and again, we talked about all the different definitions of species. We can look at a lot of different data sources to examine speciation, both with the fossil record, the morphological data, or even your molecular data. So fossil record does show examples of species that showed up all, the um, all of a sudden and then basically did not change for a period of time and then disappeared. Um, Eldridge and Gold coined this idea as punctuated equilibrium um, to describe times when the species were staying relatively stable, undergoing very limited changes, and then all of a sudden going through pretty rapid changes. This contrasts with gradualism, um, which was first described by Lyle and then Darwin, okay, where you had subtle changes take place over time, and all of those changes over time, the smaller ones led to greater distinction between the species. Um, so the punctuated pattern in the fossil record, as well as data from lab studies, suggests that speciation can be rapid. Um, this sunflower here originated because of the hybridization of some other sunflower species. Um, but the time between speciation vents um, can be short, relatively speaking for us, 4,000 years, to very extended, 40 million years, but there's a typical average of, you know, just 6.5 million years. So we also have this idea, which is where I think we get the speciation occurring all of a sudden versus gradually, is just the time period is pretty extensive. 
how many genes change when a new species forms. Um, it really depends on the species. You could have a single allele change, um, or you could have many alleles change. Here in these snails, the spiral shell direction is going to be impacted, um, is going to impact mating, um, and that is controlled by just one gene. In monkey flowers, we have two loci, loci that affect flower color, and that's going to have an impact on your pollinator. Um, and if pollination is dominated by just one particular, um, like a hummingbird or a bee, uh, that can lead to reproductive isolation for the flowers as well. So speciation is able to be um, controlled by single genes. It's able to be controlled by multiple genes, the interactions between genes. Uh, we see that in a lot of other species. So there's not one specific answer for this one. So again, speciation is kind of our connection from microevolution to macroevolution. Um, macroevolution is basically accounting for all of the speciation events that have occurred, as well as the various extinction events that have taken place on our planet.